Lady's presence that the City of Austin does hereby proclaim July 1st, 2001 as Slacker Day in Austin. Good. Oh, yeah. Good. God. We're all coming. God, everybody looks the same. Look at this guy. Look at this. I know. Yeah. Oh, you dreadlocks? Oh, Alistair? Yes. Yeah. How's it going, Richard? No way, man. Yeah. How are you doing? Got a little bit bigger. Zora? Hey. hey. How's it going? Pretty good. Good to see you. How old are you now? Uh, 17. Wow. And you're what? 20. 20? Almost 21. Yeah. September. Do we all look the same? A little bit. A little I, don't, bit. I, don't, I think you guys have changed a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's so much that I guess people don't recognize you from the movie anymore, yeah. if they ever did. Like, what oh, are you well. doing here? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you? You weren't yeah. in the movie. <laughs> hey, we're just going to go down to this end real quick. Teresa, who was our poster child for the whole movie, had a great answer. Well, I didn't like, prepare a speech or anything, but uh, I guess I didn't the day we filmed the movie either, so... Um, I just wanted to thank Rick for everything. It's so cool that so many people that I care about and that I love, creative people over the years here in Austin that have this sort of encapsulated uh, look at them. It's, it's like a time capsule for us. And even tonight I felt like, wow, these are, it's the closest cultural thing I have to like a high school reunion or something. I, I really care for the people here and the people that were involved in this film. And now it's 10 years later. And it's like, oh, wow, everybody's 10 years older. <laughs> I was moving. I, I had read the script, and um, I didn't think there were any strong women's roles. And so uh, I was like, I don't know why I would want to do a movie like that. I'm going to grad school. So um, I left, and then I was, uh, I was working. I had this sort of little job before I went to school, and so I kept calling back to Austin, talking to everybody, and it sounded like a lot of fun. So I got really homesick, so I quit my job, jumped in the car, moved back. I had like 10 days before grad school started, and it was the same sort of thing. Rick had just gotten dailies back, and they didn't like him, and they wanted to shoot the scene tomorrow, so he's like, can you do the scene tomorrow? I said, okay, and that was it. So, I mean, it was really sort of an accident that I was in it, so. Uh, the only reason I'm in the movie is because I was working on it and the guy that was supposed to play my part didn't show up that day. So Rick asked me if I'd be interested in work, being in the film and I asked him if it meant I had to work that day. He said no and I said, hell yeah, feed me, drink, I'm in there. The first day we were shooting, it was hot. The last day we were shooting and it was hot every day in between. So pretty, I think pretty much the second hottest summer I've been in Austin in 22 years. Does it look like it in the film? <laughs> I've heard it doesn't, but we just had a lot of towels around to mop people down. You get the occasional pit stain it's through in there. Stain? Yeah, there's a few good stains. There's good stain scenes, even at night. I don't know. Why don't you ask Clark Walker about the van they used to drive the equipment around and how it would only turn left. <laughs> so when they'd show up location, they'd have to take this real roundabout way to get there because the van would only turn left. The right-hand side was broken. We did pretty well with the law that summer. It would probably be different nowadays. But um, um, back then, I think the only trouble we had was when we, we were actually we were shooting live those mics, the Kendall Smith scene at the end with the things on top of his El Camino. The cops pulled us over. <laughs> and uh, there was a neighbor, because that was early in the morning, there was a neighborhood complaint, noise complaint, you know, whatever. And, <laughs> I remember, what was the, the cop was like, hey, it looks like they're campaigning. <laughs> it wasn't exactly election day, but we were campaigning. I think, I think on my scene, they, uh, they wanted to do it all in one gliding shot, and that was a great idea. And so we w woke up one morning after we had, uh, uh, Rick and I had, had nailed it after about three days, you know, kind of walking around for 45 minutes or maybe an hour, going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So it's 60% him, 40% me, and, and we had a ball. And then he turned to me and just said, that's it, it's frozen, you know, or, and walked away. I, sa I said, hey, you're, you're ruder than Brando, man, you know, I mean, you know, but, it, but everything was fine. That was the practical side, and we went with that. And I said, you're going to get it the first take or the last take, and that's all. And we did. It was the first take and the last take. Everything in between went, <laughs> there was mistakes, there was aircraft, there was UFOs, who knows what was going by, sirens, somebody dropped something. Anyway, and about six takes later, we had finished that. Oh, no, on the slate, we just had a T-tour. 
and we changed the title and often the cameraman and director's names during the filming of it. So every day we had a different title and a different director and different uh, fictitious cameraman and director on the slate every day. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing I thought was funny about the, the whole pro process of making the film was the fact that he wouldn't tell anybody what a lot of was going to happen in the rest of the film because I kept saying, what's it really about? Tell me more about it. And they give me this vague concept of it. So I kept saying, Rick, Rick, uh, I mean, where does it appear in the f Like, what's the plot? And he just wouldn't put it all together for me and he said don't worry about you just worry about your own scene don't worry about the other parts of it trust me it'll all come together uh, Rick gave me this script and I was like what the fuck is this D was really my dear friend uh, D Montgomery but I was good friends with Rick too and I was like D what's with this script man I don't go for these lines and Rick was totally cool because D goes to Rick and we're shooting it at my house we, we built the set He's like, man, Cal's not very happy with the lines. And Rick was like really kind of defensive. And we're back in the room where the whole crew is and camera crew and film. And so Dee's like, let's take this outside. And we go sit on my front porch and we walked through my lines and changed everyone. And Rick was so like giving and flexible with it. It was amazing. You know, I think I had written the Madonna pap smear part like that was an idea, just the concept, the concept that I knew you were the, you know, we knew you were the person to do that. <laughs> I remember reading an interview with you, you were talking, you were in the line of the great uh, female drummers, you know, like Karen Carpenter et al. And um, you uh, said something like, you knew what it was like, like you could relate to um, Mark David Chapman. You felt the way about Madonna, the way Mark David Chapman must have felt about Lennon, you know? So I said, oh. Killer. <laughs> so anyway. That's great love. Yeah, that's ultimate love. Yeah. I was wearing these wonderful shoes. They were gold shoes with square toes and great white applique, like great stones on them, but you could never see the shoes. It was a big problem. The shoes didn't make it into the final cut? They couldn't make it in the movie. The shoes weren't there. <laughs> but then they were really good to me, and they had, when I walked up the stairs, they had someone say, hey, Kelly, cool shoes. <laughs> so the shoes got in, like, in the atmosphere, but not on my feet. Yeah, Joe Namath got $10,000 for shaving, and you got 10 bucks. I gave Is you that 10 what I got? That day, plus the cap, or we worked out something. I, think, I don't know, me and my partner were partying that day. When you got your call, we go like, hey, man. Let's get the call. It's going to be a, maybe it's a pornography movie or something. It's in UT. <laughs> and there's my hero, fucking Johnny Rat. I was wondering if um, Johnny Rat and Ron Marks could stand next to each other so that we can all just sort of get it clear in our heads. Johnny. John. Ron. John. John. I have an original Johnny Rat. Fassbender shirt, never worn. Oh my God! This never was how I got my role in the movie. Was, do you remember that? The, I came over to your house when you were silk screening the Fassbender T-shirts, and I told Rick this whole true story about this guy blowing his brains out on on South I-35. And then much later, when he was making the film, he asked me to re recant the story. That's why it was easy to remember when you said, "Do you remember that story?" I was like, "Oh yeah." So we use that, that was a true story. If you look at the scene, we really don't talk about anything else but cars. Kind of this esoteric whatever nomenclature that wouldn't mean anything to anyone except that uh, was interested in cars. So <laughs> thank God it went on to another scene because you know people are getting probably getting bored. That's the one thing about the movie. If you're bored with it, well, you something you know five minutes later you're going to find something maybe more interesting. <laughs> The only thing I remember clearly is Steve Anderson walking up at 6 in the morning with a Budweiser. That's what I remember. He, he's walking up, he looks pretty clear-headed, all the rest of us are tired, and he walks up with a Budweiser. That's all been, I remember. Had he been up all night? or? I have no idea, because I didn't really know him, and I was just trying to figure out what his, what his secret was. And then, you know, now later I see him in... Uh, in the uh, Waterloo brewing ads, and I know what his secret is. He's made of beer. <laughs> I had probably the second worst hangover of my life when we 
were doing it that day. And it's about 100 degrees outside. I remember that. And every time we did a shot, being that there was no script, I had to make up the lines over and over again. I could never remember what I said beforehand because I was too much in the fog. So I remember it being a very trying experience. And I realized then that there's no way you can overpay an actor. Particularly hungover. Yeah, <laughs> especially a hungover one, right? We kind of had a name the movie contest at the rap party, and Slacker was one of the four or five other titles. None of us were even happy with uh, Slacker, in fact. It just sounded too much like a slasher movie or something. And uh, Thank God, though, we the votes came in, and it narrowly won over other ridiculous titles. Do you remember some? <laughs> I think it was one called No Longer Not Yet that Rick came up with, and... and uh, Oh, that was terrible, and I came up with an equally terrible uh, n name called, uh, if I can recall, it's um, like the day after yesterday, or parenthetically, the day before tomorrow. What does that mean? An existential way of saying it today? I don't know. <laughs> I think that what always happens when you see it, it comes on the Sundance channels. I mean, you have a uh, Time Warner cable, and you have the digital box with the program guide. You know, it's such a huge cast, and it's not like there's a lead character. So most of the credits you see are like the credit roll they have at the end, where it just lists them in the order of appearance. And so it usually will say Slacker, 1991, Rick Link Richard Linklater, Rudy Bosquez. <laughs> me to see what I could do to correct it. it it's kind of morphed into Judy Baskets. <laughs> a lot of listings, so we're going to try to fix this. <laughs> I like Judy. Top billing. And Jean Caffeine, right after he plays the, the dead lady in the street, she gets top billing too sometimes on the TV guy. I'm recognized around the country, and people have actually asked for autographs. <clears throat> it's unusual to be pegged in places as far as like airports and things and places you don't expect for people to say, you know, you look really familiar. I've had kind of some unnerving experiences where um, people come up to me and feel that they know me intimately or that um, something I told them had a profound effect on their life and they want, oh yeah, absolutely. And they, and I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think I've ever seen you before. And then we finally figure out, oh, a slacker. And it's a little creepy. And then there's one person that stops me every time he sees me, he says, I just can't remember your line in the film. Could you tell it to me again? And it was, oh, wow. <laughs> I remember when we were touring around the country, occasionally people come and go, you were in that film Slacker. And I finally learned to say, you're a film major, aren't you? And almost invariably, I'd be right. I was, like, <laughs> I was skiing in Colorado, and I don't ski, right? I, and I don't have neoprene or got off or whatever fleece things. Mm -hmm. And so I was bundled from head to foot in um, wool. Like wool, 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 wool. Like borrowed goggles, completely covered. And so I go to take a lesson on the bunny slope. And the instructor turns to me and says, were you in slacker? That's I'm great. like, what? <laughs> you know what? Because I mean, he couldn't see me. He couldn't see me at all. And he said he recognized my voice. So on, on the basis of that, I thought, um, Maybe there's something there. So I made a demo tape, got an agent, and uh, I was the voice of Trip.com and the Alpha Hydrox Lotion. What did it do for me? I, I think it worked in a really good way that it upped to Annie. And suddenly I'm in this big pop culture movie, and I was like, well, that was easy. The real struggle's supposed to be hard, right? So I need to outdo this. Like, I need to rise the occasion and bump it up a level. I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, the su success was easy. Getting a movie my friends are making, my dear friends, which I would gladly do almost any time. I think John's a good example of someone who, you know, everybody wants to talk about the JFK. I always have to kind of defend John. This wasn't a documentary. I mean, John had a lot of, I mean, John has a, an enormous amount of information and knowledge about a lot of subjects. Yeah. I just happened to know he knows he had the, one of what well, many was the JFK thing. So he was cast and he worked up this funny stuff and like Teresa saying you know, all that great stuff came from John. You know the book idea, all those books he had on there were his. But you know that's not like who he is. But I think he's perfect. So how exactly did I get cast as the crazy woman from the <laughs> mental institution in Dallas? Right? I'm 
mutual friend of mine and Rick's brought him to see Glass Eye, and after the set, he asked me if I wanted to be in his movie, and I was like, okay, this could have been the show. This might have been the show. How's that for irony of ironies and all those parallel universes and all that shit? Yeah, that's, that's sort of a misnomer about the film, too, is that uh, basically, I think I could probably speak for almost all the cast members, that uh, one of the things that's obvious, that wasn't obvious to the film, is that every single person had a job except for the four or five people who were working on the film. They, that's, that's one of the reasons why they're only in the film, you know, they only worked one or, you know, one or two days on the film, because everyone had to get off work to work on the film. That it, it projects this image that no one in Austin ever has a job. <laughs> Maybe they don't now, but they did then. <laughs> What's interesting, the newspaper just uh, wanted people to tell if there was a supreme slacker that they could give an award to. Is there now a slacker? And they only had about 12 people apply. Now, that's really telling. I mean, they thought, well, maybe they're, so, they're real slackers and they're so lazy they wouldn't apply to the newspaper. <laughs> and the irony, of course, the film is that nobody slacker is slacking, that everybody's, are, are, their heads are filled with ideas, they're, they're driven mad with, with passion and ideas and intelligence, they have the desire not to do just anything but to do everything. It's so amazing when I see it now, uh, not just in this wonderful arena and not just with all this love, but when I see it from a span of years where, where you can look back and see how how this is played, how it, how it kept uh, ahead. It's not behind the times. In fact, it's never dated. It's kind of, I would call it in the transcendental zone, you know. That's, you know it's a, it's, it's a, not a seminal work, it's a, it's a, a mini epic. Uh, it has so many things going on in it that, uh, and they're all from like, well, all of our minds, but guided and shepherded by a really crazy guy, you know, and you really did a grand job of shepherding all those ideas. It's a film of ideas. It's not, it's not sound bites, it's idea bites and life bites. You know how that is. Um, An important little thing. You gotta get that. This is like a little tribute to someone important named Dee Montgomery. <laughs> like in my scene in the movie too. <gasps> there we go. Okay. Yay! Hey. Now she can get in the club. I wanted to also dedicate this screening, in addition to Denise, to uh, two other cast members who aren't with us any longer. The guy who offers the paper, Skip Bolton, and the man at the end of recording into the microphone, Joseph Jones. So just in their memory. Uh, Doug the Slug, Charles Gunning, guy coming from the funeral, you know. And I had been in acting classes with that guy, and he didn't remember me at all, really. I was just like the guy sitting in the back, kind of quiet. But I remember he did an improv based on how much he hated his stepfather. And I, I always remember that. And I, I wrote the scene just based on what he said that day. You know, this is years later, I wrote down, hey, you know, this is what you're going to say. And he read it and goes, well, I can relate to this, you know. I have my stuff. <laughs> and I'd also like to acknowledge, um, I know Lewis Mackey, the old anarchist. Maybe you know. Uh, We're having a great time. I just hope that we can have a sooner, grander reunion the next time. We can celebrate everybody's life and this event, this mini epic that opens so many doors for everybody. So I'm very happy we're all still able to stand in there with the best of them. So thank you. <laughs>